Hi, I'm David Lee. Um, I uh, co-founded an accelerator here called K Startup, and uh, I also uh, run a fund uh, in the Valley that focuses on early stage uh, companies as well as some late stage. And uh, I've been traveling back and forth uh, to Korea for the last, I think now, 14 years. Um, originally, when I was at Google in 2000, um, when I established Google Korea, um, spent a lot of time here with um, kind of local partners and companies, and then since moving back to, after leaving Google, moving back to the States in the Valley, um, seeing a lot of entrepreneurs showing up there uh, from Korea was very inspirational uh, and wanting to help them kind of bridge uh, their businesses, whether it's investment or partnerships, um, has kind of led me to do more here. And so I spent the last now, I guess, four or five years um, helping startups here and, and also trying to create more of an ecosystem uh, in Korea in the Valley. And just a little bit of context, so actually David and I uh, were at Google, uh, briefly overlapping, I think, but um, David was responsible for a lot of the, the growth of the entire organization internationally around sales. So he's got a really good perspective around you know, how do you actually enter new markets from a technology standpoint. Well, Jai. Uh, so <clears throat> I, uh, I'm a founder of a seed fund based in San Francisco. It's uh, a little bit of a spin out uh, of a larger venture fund that does more US European investing early stage. Uh, we've been investing for about 40 years. Uh, that's, that fund's called Partech. But we, about five years ago, we spun out uh, Tecton as a separate C vehicle, um, <clears throat> given a lot of the activity that was happening at the early stage. And uh, you know, prior, to, prior to that, I, I've been an entrepreneur, uh, just like yourself, a few different times, mostly in San Francisco. And I think the question that I think Jonathan raised was, um, you know why I'm here, or why we're looking at Korea and other parts is is really simple. We we see the uh, we've always had historically a, a globalized investing strategy, and what we're seeing now is the quality of entrepreneurship in in pockets like Korea really evolving really quickly. And you know we saw firsthand some of the companies that we've actually supported here um, <clears throat> in in the local markets really evolve to become standalone profitable billion dollar type companies such as the coupons and, and the cacao's of the world and we really want to foster the sort of the next generation of, of entrepreneurs here so that's kind of why we've we sort of decided to really reallocate a lot of our investing strategy on a more I guess call it globalized basis we like two thirds of our investing is is typical Silicon Valley, where we're sort of based, but we have a little bit of a scout model where we work closely with local funds in other parts like Korea, China, India, and other parts where we can invest locally on the ground with direct um, uh, investments or capability. So, um, yeah, so that's what about my. And to give some context here, I actually met Jai maybe about six years ago, <clears throat> and uh, back then he was talking about what was going on outside of Silicon Valley, because his background, obviously, is very international. And he said that there's a lot of interesting activity going on in Korea. I'm going to start looking there. And talk about being visionary, he was one of the seed investors in Coupang that's doing amazingly well. So we're going to ask him a little bit uh, further down the line about that experience and you know, working with entrepreneurs like that to build really large, interesting companies in, in a market like this. John? Um. So my day job is I run something called Techstars in London, which is, I just, my description is that it's Techstars version of the rest of the world. Um, hopefully it will not be the only office outside of the US. There will be multiple other programs we'll be looking to open in t due time. Um, the other hat I have on is uh, I'm a founder of a business called F6S, which is essentially a, uh, for want of a better word, Facebook for startups. We, it's used by a lot of accelerators. Um, what's interesting for this audience is there's about 70,000 startups on that platform at the minute. A third of them are in the US, a third are in, in Europe, and a third are the rest of the world, which really shows how the rest of the world is growing in terms of popularity of startups. Right. Um, why am I here? Well, 
there's a the sign over there which says Venture Square. I actually bought a pizza for a startup weekend about two years ago. Of course you did. And the pizza, I, I offered to buy some pizza at a startup weekend in Seoul, which then meant I got published in Venture Square, which then meant I found a team called Fleeto, which is based mm -hmm. here, which went to uh, Springboard, which was the predecessor of Techstars. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then in Techstars, I managed to acquire another team called Smile Family. And so in my portfolio, two of my best performing teams are actually from South Korea, awesome. um, which is why I'm here, because I, I can't not be here. If, if I'm getting good teams from this part of the world, it would be negligent of me not to be spending time here. And, and you know, John, John over at Techstars, I, this is my personal... Um, uh, opinion, but they are one of the most interesting incubators out there because they've really early on identified what's going on around the world. And I think they have actually, um, you know, we're all still learning, but they've perfected to date the model around having these incubators and support systems globally. So, you know, really, really interesting model. I think we can learn a lot from, from John yeah, over here. One of the things we love is finding ecosystems with a chip on the shoulder. Yep. Um, so we, we're inherently not built around Silicon Valley, we're actually built around clusters which exist around the world. And one of the things we're very good at is working with clusters outside of the valley. And we're going to talk about that right after this, right after Ned. Yeah, so my name is Ned Jacobson. Uh, I'm a mountain biker, but I'm also a co-founder and a uh, general partner of, of uh, Spark Labs and also Spark Labs Accelerator. Uh, I've been involved in international um, I've been the international guy in many companies in the past, uh, mostly by accident, uh, starting at, at Sony Ericsson, uh, ICQ in Israel, AOL, uh, Maxton, a Chinese browser company, uh, and eventually I ended up at uh, Facebook, where I ran international business development and mobile business uh, from 2007 and a couple of years forward. Um, I came back to Israel uh, two years ago, <laughs> and was convinced to run, to be the CEO for a company called Ginger Software. And Ginger Software built a software, a platform for people who speak English as a second language. And obviously Korea is one of the biggest markets beside Japan and China for English as a second language. So I started traveling here back and forth and was very fascinated by it. Um, and um, ended up um, um, becoming a mentor to Spark Labs uh, Accelerator. And that's actually why I'm here. And, Later on, together with the other partners here, we formed Spark Labs Global Ventures to, to look for uh, global investments around the world. Uh, and, and um, you know, I, I moved from being an entrepreneur to an investor quite recently. Um, and um, it's something I always wanted to do. I don't see myself as an investor, although sometimes I have to think as an investor. But I see myself as an entrepreneur, and I know that everybody else in Spark Labs, we see ourselves as entrepreneurs. We are you know, former entrepreneurs and, 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 uh, and operators. And we see all these like, hubs around the world, just like John talked about, and clusters. We know that there is talent all over the world, not only in Silicon Valley. And we want to be there. We want to help. And we want to fund the first stages. And so that's why I'm here. So let me speak to that. So you know, um, Ned talks about being an entrepreneur first. And I saw that firsthand yesterday. We were actually on a, on a working session yesterday talking about globalization of businesses. And um, as an investor, because John was really crucial to the expansion strategies and expansion work of, of Facebook um, you know, a few years ago, there were so many great tidbits of operational um, you know, tactics that, that he conveyed to the audience yesterday that I think it'll be really interesting to hear some of, some of that perspective come out, you know, really at the ground level, and how do you actually open up um, a, a, a new uh, R&D center, a new sales center around the world. So um, thanks, guys. Um, what I would like to dive into now, just very, very quickly, maybe specifically towards John, um, because you, you've got a lot of, um, you know, uh, exposure to international markets, and maybe the rest of you can chime in, but there are a lot of hot bits of innovation happening outside of Silicon Valley. You know, there's been a lot of commentary that Silicon Valley is a little bit tired now, um, and we're seeing innovation come out from everywhere else. Maybe you guys can talk, and maybe lead with you, John, about where you see these hotspots going around the world. Um, and then when you think about Korea and in its relation to some of these other hotspots, what is the point of leverage that you think Korea has? And from there, you know, hopefully we can dive into a little bit more media items. 
So I don't think Silicon Valley's got any chance of going away anytime soon. But I have this strange analogy of I think of Silicon Valley is very like Apple or iOS, which is it, it operates within certain parameters very, very well, which is if you're in the valley and you get investment from the valley and you're within 30 blocks of the investor, it works exceptionally well. It's a well-oiled machine. It, it, it's well-networked. People know each other very well. But as soon as you try to not be in the valley or one of those core components is not there, it kind of starts to fall apart. The rest of the world I describe is a bit like Android, which is, it's kind of a bit messy. It's a bit fragmented. And it doesn't work just as well. And every single market has a slightly different variant or brand mm -hmm. or version of what they do. And so if you think of the rest of the world as a less mature version of Silicon Valley, I think the thing that we, we see is there are certain markets, and I was describing this to Niall now, somewhere in the front row there, that actually certain parts of markets are really good at certain things. They haven't quite got the end-to-end -end bit. So um, Israel and Korea I actually put together, which is very smart technical engineers, but really rubbish at business. Yeah, You look at Berlin. Berlin is exceptionally good at what I call scale-up because of all of the inherent knowledge that's been built up around rock internet. But bloody hell, they're useless at discovery at that really early stage. So what they do is they copy everybody else. They'll figure that bit out. Mm -hmm. The UK is actually pretty good at discovery because it's a pretty creative environment. But because we haven't had enough depth of experience, we still lack a lot of the scale up bits. And you can see if you start to think around the planet, this kind of the difference between the different elements that actually there's maybe ways to shortcut some of those parts by actually saying, if we took people out of South Korea and somehow helped support their business from a business context or a sales context, maybe there's inherently a way to speed up the, the development of the system. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add that you know one advantage we have in the Valley, and I think what's getting better here is just, I mean, obviously what John was, John was pointing out is the ecosystem. Yep. And simply put, I mean, being in venture as an investor, you're, you're in the service business. You're, you're helping uh, startups with various things, opening a Rolodex, giving them guidance. But at the end of the day, you know, attorneys, um, uh, you know, different service folks, accountants, they're all sort of geared in the valley to support startup companies. And I think once that similar ecosystem is in place in Korea, meaning there's a large focus around that, it's a lot easier for an entrepreneur to do more to start his company and to exit his company. So end to end, definitely. And I think it's growing here. It's getting better. There's more awareness around it. But that's the big advantage we have in the valley. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the things to note, and sort of going back to the previous question, um, of why we spend sort of uh, the time, you know, on a plane going out, and and really, you think about venture. It's not a very scalable business in, in our business. And I think the the lesson for us is that if we don't expand, we will die. And it's the same principle that we take with our business because our business is in a, it, I guess, it, in many ways, it's, it's in a in a role of disruption, because the traditional early stage model has really changed. And, and I think everyone here can attest to, to that in terms of the how there's a lot of early stage capital, relatively speaking, and there's a, and now the typical early stage funds have become more later stage in, in, in sort of investment activity. And I think one of the th reasons why I think if we think about the traits of an entrepreneur across other, I guess, globalized hubs is in many ways you have this, um, the, I guess to previously note, a chip on your shoulder because in, in, I, I think, in, in, in my opinion, that the entrepreneurs in the Valley are a bit spoiled mm -hmm. because they have this ecosystem that's extremely fruitful and extremely efficient, but that gets, you, in many ways, that gets you lazy and you, it, 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 may, it gets you a little complacent. And I think the, the models that are just evolving in other markets like Korea and, and other places, it, you have to prove something and you have to have an edge from day one. And it's not just, be, and, and I, was, I was reading a, a blog of one of the other venture fund, funds and they mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, you, uh, in the Valley, you, you've been spoiled to, to look at a metric of success as raising capital. That's the beginning of, of really building a company. And I think in many ways, you know, entrepreneurs here in the stage have, have even, you know, thought about how, how do we sustain a company without even raising capital and literally bootstrap. And I think so, 
the lesson here for us and why we kind of look out of the traits are that it's, it's just that ability to really be scrappy and, and, and do whatever it takes and to have a vision in mind, basically, that can, can drive the ecosystem and being able to contribute that and really pay it forward to, to, your, to the fellow colleagues that are sitting next to you guys. Mm -hmm. I, I really like that, that train of thought. Let's, let's keep on it. Uh, and, and, you know, think about Korea specifically. Um, what, what do you see? You guys have invested in a bunch of great entrepreneurs. What do you see are the kinds of traits that are necessary for entrepreneurs here to really succeed and stand out? Maybe some personal stories around the folks that you've interacted with and, and what you like about the ones that are successful. Yeah. I think that there, I mean, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of um, common uh, uh, factors that we constantly keep hearing that is very, you know, common, makes sense to everyone. But I think that the one thing that really stands out for me are two things is really, uh, they have to be a hustler. Hustler, a relentless hustler uh, that never gives up, that never takes no for an answer, and that always seeks new options. Uh, and the second thing is domain specific knowledge, a very deep knowledge of the industry that they are taking on. Uh, and if they don't have those two, they're going to have much more uh, uh, difficulties in, in, in building the business. Or, and the, the only way to kind of um, compensate for, for at least not having enough domain specific knowledge is being you know, good enough to hiring the right people to having that specific domain specific knowledge. Uh, but Hustler, I think if I look at all our companies, those that really succeed, it's not about, hey, they're going after the right market opportunity, or it's really disrupting business. It really comes down to the DNA, DNA of the founder and the founding team. And you see those that are really cracking under pressure. Uh, maybe they're running out of options. Today it's easier to raise seed money. It's easier to fail today, to start failing. Just like you see in Korea, you see a lot of governments is handing out a lot, quite a lot of money for, for, at the first stage to start up. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a lot of, very difficult for most people afterwards, companies that actually raise a uh, Series A round. And the same goes for, for specifically for Europe, but definitely also Silicon Valley. But in, in Europe, you have to hustle so much more to be able to come to, to, to the right type of investors. So, so I, 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 I like that thinking. Hustling is one of those traits that we see all around the world, right? right? Um, maybe, maybe now I directed to John. You see great hustler, hustle, and, hustle and entrepreneurs everywhere. What is it that you think specifically entrepreneurs here need to have a real hustle about? What do they need to solve specifically with the, uh, you know, never say die attitude? I'm actually going to take this conversation in a different direction mm -hmm. and be a little bit controversial. And probably I'll be down for this later on. I asked all of them to do that. That's cool. Um, I actually think um, you need to have a good command of English. Mm. If you are Very really good. interested in having a startup which exists outside of the borders of Korea, you need to speak English really well. And actually what's really interesting is this conference is entirely in English. And that's a really positive sign. Mm -hmm. um, whether we accept it or not, people always have a bias towards someone who they're talking to, no matter how technically smart they are. If you can communicate particularly outside of the valley, in English, very well, it goes a long, long way. Dry. Actually, of the two, the two teams that I've worked with, mm -hmm. that is singularly the one of the things. And actually, in a weird way, that's one of the reasons why they ended up leaving Korea, because they actually needed to go and sit somewhere else and listen to people speaking English and talking English for 90 days. Yep. And, and the way they spoke before and during and after was fundamentally different. That's a, that's a really good point. Jai, I know you may have a different example, though. So, you know, you work with the Kupang founders. Um, were, they, were they very fluent in English when they first started out? Well, I, so, I'll, I'll tell you, like, the, the point, I'll, make, I'll get to the, the, yep. that sort of an, the question, but um, I, I agree with you. I, I think, John, with the one due respect, I think the one thing that, <laughs> that it's almost assumed, I, I think that mm -hmm. you, you either have to think global from day one. And I think many, in many ways, I go back to my previous point, that uh, in the Valley, you're a little bit spoiled um, to, with all these interesting ideas and opportunities and investors and the ecosystem is, is very... For, I think the natural inclination is that um, you, you will ultimately try to figure out and compensate for your handicaps, fundamentally. But to sort of answer your, to, to, to your, to your question is... Um, the global mindset, like for example, even Bomb, the founder of Copan, was, you know, he, he was the, 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 you know, study. He grew up in in Korea, but he studied internationally in the states, and you know, and that's not necessarily unique per se. But 
if you think about, if I, if I saw his sort of evolution as, uh, from, you know, coupon as an idea, and, it's, and his model has changed like through two or three different times. And the, the main message that I think is different or unique about him and his approach is that he always looked at the global markets as either a, an example and a way to adapt his business. So if you think about even the sort of the evolutionary, you know, the evolution of the company, it went from a Groupon to a flash sale to an Amazon now. I mean, that, if, if you were to summarize kind of the, and it's, and it's all Korea, right? And you think about that and you kind of go, well, why isn't Amazon even here? And you sort of think about the obvious. Oh, well, there's EMAR, there's GMAR, there's all these sort of models localized. But, you know, he figured out that there's all these very successful models and mentors and examples in other places. And he, you know, found a network of people in other markets to rely on. So even, you know, signing up an advisory group of people that are not just local but international in mind, I think that was the thing that, I th that really stood out. And, and I go back to sort of the, I think the real crux of this is what really stands out of someone like him or, or someone that's become successful is that what we've seen is they really drive an authenticity to what they want to achieve, either a problem or an opportunity. And that authenticity really just naturally comes out in the, the way that they build the company the way that they have a vision, the way that they, they build a corporate culture. And it's very different than what you might necessarily think. It, it, it may be US sort of inspired, but then it's locally adapted. And I, I, I talk about this as I, you know, with, in a previous session I was on, and um, uh, the, the entrepreneurs I've seen here tend to do really well at truly customizing or adapting uh, the models. So, like, let's say you're, you're looking at all these different consumer models. There's always, a, I call it a cracking the code sort of mentality that I've seen in some of these entrepreneurs locally here, and even you know, in not only in the Korean markets but in the U.S. markets. And and that's the question that I would always be asking is, what's the code that you have to crack to mm -hmm. scale? So, right. So I've heard hustle. I've heard language, I've heard, you know, having a mission, and I've also heard having some kind of ingenuity in, in, in the specific market here. David, do you have one more point that you might want to throw yes, in? Yes, so I think for me, you know, when we talk to entrepreneurs, whether they're in the States or in Korea, it's kind of the same core fundamentals are really not that different. And for me, there's two that stick out. One is um, being super focused on your product, yep. I mean, to the point of being obnoxious, that that's all you think about. An example is, one investor, uh, one uh, entrepreneur that we invested in, a uh, 19-year-old uh, guy, he was from Israel originally, part of Y Combinator, but nobody was investing in his company because he didn't finish school. It was his first startup. Um, but when he met him, you know, all he would, you know, um, obsess about was search. He was building this this interesting search platform that was searching the cloud, called Greplin. So we eventually invested. We were the only ones. But then after a couple of years. Things got really uh, smoother, better. He was hiring more people. He's maturing as an entrepreneur, but was always believing in his dream. Like no matter what anyone told him, uh, you know, kept going. Eventually, he sold the company to Apple. I think about two years later, which was it was for me it was inspirational to see because he could have been anybody. He could have been someone from Korea or here, but he had the core fundamental. And the second, really quick, is really being focused on communication, as John's saying, but internally. So I think as an entrepreneur, having leadership. And communication skill is very important because it's one thing to you know start a company with your co-founder, but it's another thing to have to hire a team and manage them. And that's one thing that I see as a big stumbling block for an inexperienced entrepreneur. But you know, if you have that scalability early, we can see that. That's a that's a telltale sign that the guy will do well or a gal will do well. So we hustle, we got communications, we got having a mission, we got focus, we got being you know creative and in, in adapting to the local market. These are all great, but you guys as investors, and I'll throw in my, 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 uh, my own thoughts there. How do you guys test for this? I mean, when you meet an entrepreneur, and I'm not sure how many in the crowd and the audience are entrepreneurs, but when you go to talk to an investor, you're like, what the hell are you trying to figure out of this uh, interaction? Maybe you guys can give some insight into that thought process. Uh, let me take a crack at it. So uh, <laughs> not, I, don't, I don't know if it's a te testing. We don't try to put... On your on your brain and oh, yeah, test person out. Well, that's later after you accept our term sheets. But uh, uh, the the mentality that we take fundamentally to, to keep it simple is um, 
we look at the process of investing is, is really like a dating process, really, at the end of the day. It's, it's would I want to marry this person? And we marry lots oh. of... Or would they People. want to marry you? Yeah, yeah, vice versa. And, and it's a two-way... Jai, Jai lives in San Francisco, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Literally, literally. So, uh, <laughs> Have they been divorced before? Okay. <laughs> Several times. Well, that's the personal... Okay. Serially. <laughs> I, I won't comment in there. In parallel. <laughs> All right, come on, get to the meeting. So, All right. So it's, it's, a, it's fundamentally a dating process, a two-way. And whether it be testing, it's... We have, obviously, a list of fundamental, I call it, uh, deal breakers that, that everyone sort of knows, you know, product, team, focus. And I think, that, I think that the reality is, is that everyone has unique filters that they prefer. Each partnership at a, partner, at a, at a fund has certain preferences, and, and you guys do too. And I think the message to you would be, it, it's a collaborative exchange. And... You know, I think that one of the things that is unique about the Valley is that you have this mentality, like this urgency, this in Korean, like the coupe. Everyone's coupe because there's so much capital, and I think the 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 the, the fallacy of that is that if you want to just take, I call it dumb money, there's a lot of it out there. But if you really want to find the right spouse or partner, I think those are the kinds of traits and the qualities that we look for that 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 everyone will be looking for of good people good insight, domain, all the same things that you guys are looking at. We're looking for the same things. Right. So, okay, so maybe one of you guys can talk about how you actually figure that out. Well, uh, um, so I'll tell you the other way around. So I don't know about you guys, but I suspect this is probably similar. Is w I obsess a lot about my portfolio, what, which teams work, which ones didn't. I also look at the ones I missed and try to figure out why did I not pick that team? And then they went on to make a million dollars or a billion dollars. That really pisses me off. Um, so, so I'm on record as Joel Gascoigne, who runs Buffer. I remember meeting him four weeks into Buffer, which was in Manchester at the time. And I said, what a stupid, bloody idea. Go and do something more interesting instead. Uh, there, I fucked up on that one. Um, <laughs> And, and not only are you looking at your own portfolio, you're also looking at common portfolios across the board. But it's, it's simplest level is data, it's, it's pattern recognition. Can you see patterns in where you've worked and where you've failed? And that's the hardest reason why it's really difficult to describe, like, what are you specifically looking for? Because in any given combination, like, yes, he's super obsessive about product and has got no... Um, uh, uh, skills uh, to actually communicate with third parties, but he's got a really interesting co-founder that can deal with that. It's, there's not, it's, it's more like, much as I'd hate to say it, it's much more like an art than a science. Yeah, as no. a former psychologist, I think I can speak... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Credibility. Actually, yeah, exactly. No, we all have this checklist, I think, you know, what we should look, be looking for and what we think are the good traits of the entrepreneur. But I think, like, personally, it all comes down to, like, just a gut feeling. It's, for me, at least, it's just intuition. I just want to feel good when I listen to them. I want them to, under, to explain, articulate in a simple way, as short as possible, that I understand what business they're going for. That it's, a, you know, obviously, the checklist is, like, huge addressable market. Yeah, he understands. He has domain-specific knowledge. All these things I assume he has before he comes. But then, when you meet them, and it's really about, like, how do I feel about this person? Does this, do I believe in him or her? Do I believe in that person? Because, like I said, we're going to get married, and it's much more difficult to get divorced from an investor than to get divorced from a marriage, I've heard. So, uh, I think it's, like, it's all about intuition, it's, it's at least for me. Uh, but... And then again, there are, there are moments when you say, like, okay, I've checked this, this, this really worked out, I believed in this, and this, and, and then everything, you know, it, just, it failed anyway. It's like, yep. what did I, you know, it's more about, like, your own process. What didn't I read wrong? What did I read wrong? You know, what did I, was it just a good day? Uh, did I feel very good about myself, about who, was the weather good? It wasn't hot in the room, the coffee was good, I made a fast decision, this guy recommended me to them, and I made a fast decision. It's like, you know, kind of like that. And then in the other cases that you give a, an entrepreneur that is brilliant a really, really hard time for no reason. 
And, and then you realize, oh, you had a bad day. Um, you know, there are many factors that weighed in on our decision-making process, I think. But at the end of the day, I think it's just like the gut feeling, you know, do I believe in that person? It's just about belief. Yeah. You can be wrong, of course. David? Yeah, I think a lot of what they said is true, definitely, but, and we're not fortune tellers, uh, especially with early stage companies. A lot of it is serendipity. You meet a company, they're great. You, like, you, like you said, they had a good day and then you happen to invest. But for me, um, you know, a lot of it is gut feeling to their point because you don't have a lot of points of data. You don't have revenue. It's not an Alibaba that you can look at the, uh, the past revenue and, and, uh, and all, the, all the other stuff that's available. So a lot of it is going on gut. And you know, at Google, as, as Jonathan knows, uh, we had this thing where after checking your background and everything, you know, the very last question is what's called the airport test. And basically, the person who's looking at you or hiring you, you know, can you, can you be in an airport with this person for more than three hours? Meaning, is there chemistry? Which is very something that you can't really you know, write down or it's not empirical, but it's something you feel. Um, when we're raising funds, um, surprisingly, a lot of people um, will ask us, the, the investors, so you know, how long have you worked with this partner of yours? You know, versus asking me, well, how many investments have you done and what are your exits like? So I think the chemistry equation is super important and definitely when, when looking at mm -hmm. companies, it's bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm going through the process of selection for the next program, which starts in November. And we've been doing a lot of work, well, in our, and in our brains rather than physically. I have, I have um, a co-MD who's German, and he writes checklists that you've never seen. It's incredible. And then he comes up with this analysis and ends up with a yes or no. I just got yes or no on my piece of paper. <laughs> but what's really, one of the things that we've really struggled with is, as Techstars has evolved in London, we've inherently got more interesting teams. We're not doing what typically you see in an accelerator. So we get really young teams, we get really early teams, but we've got teams which have got seed funding. We've got, I mean, I was talking to one the other day, it's got a million dollars in the bank, and then it phoned us and said, can we come and do your program? Some have got product, product market fit, they're scaling, some have got um, revenue. But one of the things that we've done when we've looked back on our analysis is those other things are not proof points. And the thing is, they can be really distorting signals, which is, but they've got revenue. Mm, not sure about the team. Or they've raised a million dollars from smart investors. Mm, but not sure about the team. And somehow, particularly at a really early stage, you almost have to, like, as I described to some of the guys when they're making decisions, is if you only could look at the team bit of the slide, would you invest in them? Forget about everything mm -hmm. else. And particularly as the market's rising at the minute, there are teams so you can get really early stage growth really, really quickly. You can get money relatively early, but they are not predictors of success. Yep. The only really strong predictor of success is actually the team, which is really difficult to get your head around. Yep. Yeah, so, so it, it, internally in our partnership, I think one of the things, we have different, I call it, if I were to pattern match, we have a few different use cases of ultimately how we, it's not so much the traits, but the, the kind of profile of a an imbe potential investment. So you have the, because especially fundamentally in seed to, to what John noted is, you don't have a lot of data. And it's easier if, if I had worked with someone for years, but most of the times these are companies come in fresh. And so, um, you know, if, if you really think about it at the end of the day, you have a few hours with, with someone. And within that, that you know, few hours, you have to gauge not only a personality, a coachability, a focus, and a desire to sort of prove something, all in that, you know, that time frame. And I think the, the, the reality is that what we really single-handedly realize is that even if the, the, the investments have not worked out fundamentally, we we've seen the pattern that these are people that it may not be the first venture that we might be a part of that we that either has done, been successful or not but it's the future ventures because we've seen through the 30 40 years that it might have been obvious that the idea might have been interesting but that second or third company has done rocket ship we've had cases like that where where the company you know had a mild exit you know a 3 to 5 times you know, in a short amount of time, and they come back with a bigger idea. And then it, it literally comes and you kind of go, wow, like, 
if we weren't part of the first one, because we, we could have easily sort of discounted and said, oh, it's not a big enough idea. It, it would not have allowed us to get into that next opportunity. So there's a lot of, I call it um, internal, um, I would say, rationale around it. And no one trait or whatnot comes to mind, I think, ultimately, but really kind of getting a sense of what the team um, you right. know, potential could be. Let, let, me, let me jump in here. So, so you know, um, all these guys here invest at a very, very early stage. Um, I'll throw in my, my perspective because I, I, you know, I run a fund binary and we do um, later stage in the sense, you know, we do Series A financing. So it's typically what these guys, these days is later stage, um, what these guys uh, have invested in. And we take a look at um, the co companies coming out of a lot of these incubators. And, and where these guys is all around gut and, and patent matching because they're looking at a whole bunch of different companies. They have the luxury as investors to get married 20 times in a year, right? The entrepreneur doesn't. Um, for us, we, we, we invest in only two companies a year, individually. And, and what we spend our time on is trying to get the data that you didn't have access to. So what I test for, you know, I, I think about uh, the entrepreneurs I back, like Evan over at Snapchat, like uh, Sean over at Tinder, uh, Systrom over at Instagram, and even Evan, Evan Biz at Twitter. And, and the thing that, that stands out, really, there, there are two things. One is just their maniacal focus on the mission, to David's point. Uh, but secondly, we spend a lot of time with their data sets to figure out how they've made decisions. Because the most important thing to us is how an entrepreneur chooses to take a product in one direction or another. And the, the, the thing that I found as the most interesting trait and the thing that I test for through this data exercise is are they willing to throw away every single piece of their product and start from scratch if the data doesn't support its success. And the reason that's important is because if you already test for them having a strong mission and a direction they want to go, and they're not married to a specific approach, you have a winner on your hands. Because these are the entrepreneurs that are going to be able to say, that's where I want to go. This road is not taking me there anymore. I'm going to jump to another boat. I'm going to jump to another path. And that's what we look for. So, uh, you know, maybe just to give you guys a sense that every investor at every stage looks for different things. And wherever you guys are at in your funding cycle or, you know, how you're thinking about approaching investors, figure out where you are and the best investor for, for what you're doing. Um, so I, I hope that kind of wrapped up the, the, the conversation around, you know, what you guys look for. Can, um, can I add something? I sure. mean, there's something which is... I find really inherently interesting about stuff we did. David touched on it earlier, which is the business we're in is a service business. Mm -hmm. You talked about the need for how you treat your entrepreneurs on the first thing is how you define yourself of do they come back and say, can I have more money, even if it wasn't successful. Um, whilst we live in a digital age, and this is all about Twitter, and this is all about Skype, and all these sorts of wonderful tools that are available to us, coming back to your original question, which is why are we here, right. is this is a person, this is a people business. And it's not just investment as a people business, startups as a people business. And how you interact with investors is a signal to how you interact with your people, is a Absolutely. signal to how you interact with your partners. And the thing is, the interpersonal skills, and people sometimes bury themselves too much in the code mm -hmm. and not enough in, with the people around them. And that's what's actually going to turn you into a massive business. Agree. So, I mean, by, by the time it comes to, to us, I think we assume that you guys are smart, you guys are driven, you guys are motivated. And the difference that stands out, the, 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 that company is really sort of, can we work with this team? Because at this stage, it can either be an idea or a, a simple beta or alpha, and we have to go through the cycle. And so it, if fundamentally that mind share to want to go through the ups and downs is not aligned, it, it doesn't work out for both parties, right? I've, I've been in situations where, you know, to my better judgment, I back something that was kind of momentum driven. It, and kind of, I call it, we call it the party rounds, right? Where everyone puts in a small little check into right. the valley. Yeah, right? Because they're just so popular, right? And in hindsight, the, the, the ones that have really worked out are the opportunities where we've actually been able to align and understand what are areas that we can help you. Because fundamentally, it's, it is a people-driven business, whether it be this first venture or the 100th venture. And that's, 
that's kind of the, the alignment that we need to have throughout the process of whether you're a, a, a seed company to a more profitable venture. Right. So, so you know, we, we, we've talked a lot about the team, but maybe now, you know, taking a, a, a step back, let's talk about the ecosystem that you see here in, in South Korea. And, you know, David, you mentioned a little bit about um, why you're interested in this space and, and not being a fortune teller. But I'm going to ask you guys to be fortune tellers for a little bit because you've seen a lot of ecosystems grow up. Even Silicon Valley, you've seen you know, New York, you've seen you know, London. And Korea is relatively still in the early stages. If you were to look two, three, four years down the line, and I was asking a lot, but where do you see the ecosystem maturing? How do you see the capital markets catching up with it? Um, where would you give advice for an entrepreneur here um, say, okay, if you're building a business now, this is what's going to happen in your funding environment. This is what's going to happen in your competitive environment. This is how the rest of the world is going to start to see you, the kind of resources that are going to be available to you. It's a, it's a meaty question. We don't have that much time, but I'd love to get just the sound bites for you know, some of the, the things at the top of mind. Maybe, maybe start with, uh, start with uh, Ned. Yeah, I would just like... I'd like to compare a little bit. To, I mean, I've been back and forth to Korea maybe for, let's like, say, one and a half uh, years. So, and my exposure to the Spark Apps uh, Accelerator and, and, and working with my partners who have more insight here have kind of opened up gradually, but I definitely am not, not an expert on, on, on this ecosystem here. But what I've seen reminds me a little bit of a pattern uh, in a different, totally different country, uh, and that's Finland. Finland and Helsinki. And what does Finland and Helsinki has in common with, with, with Korea? So uh, Finland had Nokia. It was the big, uh, the, the big uh, employer for a lot of tech people. Uh, Finnish people are usually very um, uh, introverted, not very extroverted. Uh, they weren't very good maybe at pitching initially, and, and you wouldn't think about as, as a general uh, uh, entrepreneur. Uh, but through the experience in working for Nokia, getting a lot of international exposure, traveling back and forth to Silicon Valley and elsewhere, they, they gradually kind of uh, became more international and more entrepreneurial in a way. And eventually when Nokia kind of started to, to, to slow down in growth and, and running into trouble, it, all kind of, of new startups grew out of, of that kind of, like, out of the ashes of Nokia in a way. New startups and new, new environments started to, 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 to develop in Finland. And I see in a way similar here, although you know you wouldn't say that Samsung and LG are in any way going down the ashes, but you're starting to see a lot of young people don't want to work for LG and they don't want to work for Samsung anymore. They want a different approach. They don't want to be lifers in a big co company. Or they might have started to work from one of these companies or had international exposure, traveling more, maybe spend some time in the valley or elsewhere, and starting to travel back and forth. So they're bringing that exposure and that kind of what we sometimes call Silicon Valley state of mind back into Korea. And I see that, that that is, for every time I come back, I see a little bit more and more of that starting to spread here. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I, so that's a pattern that I am start seeing. If it's going to, you know, fundamentally change over the next two, three years, I don't think so. I think there's a very positive wave. I think it's great that the government is making it easier to fail, in meaning starting your, your first startup, getting the first money. Uh, it gives a, a lot of entrepreneurs a chance that maybe wouldn't have dared the first time. Unfortunately, many of them are going to fail faster than elsewhere because right. they are not going to be able to raise money. But um, I would say that th there is a very positive atmosphere here. I see a lot of interest from uh, uh, investors outside of, of Korea and also entrepreneurs. And here's a funny thing. So I'm based in Tel Aviv and I'm getting all these requests from Israeli companies and entrepreneurs wanting to come to Korea and start their business here. And I asked them, I said, why? You live in a startup nation. Why do you want to go to Korea? Well, you know, it's Asia, it's exciting, it's a different market, you know, it's messaging market, it's, it's a market. They are no longer looking to the US to kick off their business. They want to go here and they see Seoul as a way of kicking off. And, mm. and I think that's a very interesting pattern. So I see a lot of people taking interest in Seoul and Korea, um, definitely positive with all the accelerators and all the uh, uh, things that, that, that are happening here. Um, it's not going to fundamentally change over the next two, three years, but it's right. definitely moving in the right direction. Is that something you guys agree with, disagree with? Love Just David? in a nutshell, I, what I've seen the evolution in the past couple of years is that more young Korean entrepreneurs are, are less risk averse. So they're more willing to take a risk than before. 
Um, and I don't know it's because, whether it's just culturally related or whether it's because they're much more entre entrepreneurial. A friend of mine who's running um, Samsung's, um, one of their accelerators in the US told me the biggest har hardship that he has is dealing with a lot of the senior executives at Samsung in Korea because their mindset is, much, is very much set in manufacturing mindset. You know, let's do what we're told. We don't ask any questions. We don't think outside the box. Where when he meets entrepreneurs in the valley, they just want to get outside the box. That's all they think about. Um, and I think that risk adversity from, from not only entrepreneurs in Korea is, is changing, but also investors. So first coming here, a lot of the term sheets that um, entrepreneurs got were you're held personally liable if you fail. If your startup fails, you have to pay back the money, uh, almost like a promissory note. And that right there will just kill innovation. So that's changing as well. There's more, more you know, investor-friendly and also entrepreneur-friendly uh, term sheets, which are very much like we see in the Valley. And also just from the, uh, from the entire eco, is that's changing completely. I, think what, I don't know whether it's copying the Valley, but it's becoming more open so people don't have a fear of failing. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so the, the thing which struck me when I first arrived is, in some ways, um, Seoul and South Korea is like living in the future. The idea of being able to turn on your phone or have a one gig um, broadband connection is just completely insane. For somebody who lives in East London, that's just like, we, we take about six months to get broadband connected into an eighth, and then it's really shit. And actually what's really interesting is a slight aside, there's a couple of stories. One is, I know of a South Korean team that actually degraded their broadband so that they could pretend what it would be like if it wasn't in Korea. Like if we had to run this in the UK or Europe, what would it look like on something which wasn't just as quick? And they actually had to think about how they changed their product because some parts of the world you don't have 4G, you don't have gigabit down, downstream. The interesting, the cultural impact is also fundamentally interesting. And actually, probably the, one of the biggest things which is hard to make go faster, if that makes sense. It, it takes time for people to evolve their mindset. And, and a stupid but interesting version of what you described is, um, I'm aware of certain people, uh, naming no names, who struggle to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend because they're an entrepreneur and don't work for LG or Samsung. Because it's like, it's not, so, it's a social stigma of, oh, you couldn't get a real job, so you had to start your own business. <laughs> and little things like that actually will break down over a period of time, but they just don't disappear overnight. So from an infrastructure point of view, you're miles ahead of everybody else. But culturally, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that just needs to catch up. So, Jai, maybe, what, what do you think uh, entrepreneurs here need to look out for over the next uh, two years as these changes start to happen? Yeah, the one thing that I guess maybe I'm on my own uh, high horse on this is that the thing that I haven't seen, quite frankly, is we, the first generation, I call it, have been very consumer-driven entrepreneurs, I call it, really the cacaos and the, and, and the coupons and these, and the, these companies that are now becoming sort of staple businesses. And if you think about the evolution now is I have yet to see really a strong, I call it, B2B or, you know, if you think about sort of the, you know, this, I call it monopolistic sort of infrastructure type type country, you still have large incumbents that ha have multiple lines of business that have to be disrupted. So I think that the, the key is here would be for me is find a problem that is not being, ad that's either being addressed in a less than optimal way and really disrupt it because that is really what you have the opportunity to do now because now as, you, as, you evol as the ecosystem is evolving, you're gonna have the, the, the experience and the capital and the, and the know-how to do it and don't just sort of take the status quo. I mean, sort of David's talking about is, you know, think out of the box about just, oh, we can't do that. No, you can because you think about even just the examples of what's going on in the U.S. of like all the Uberization, right, the on-demand economy, and building this modern-day logistics sort of company. There is an opportunity to build that kind of a company here in, in Korea at even a probably a faster pace mm -hmm. because the, the call it the status quo, even though it may be a, a, a sort of efficient, there's better ways of delighting a customer. And I think just one thing to note on a, a sort of a story was, you know, uh, the founder of Coupon, the one thing that, that was interesting to me about him was 
he was extremely fanatical about the customer experience, even to the point where he wanted to open up call centers and, and listen in, and he actually wanted to do phone calls of, of being in the call center. He wanted to hear what's going on kind of directly, and I think you know, kind of finding unorthodox ways of, of almost delighting the customer and being fanatical gives you some inherent advantage that you won't be able to, that that the, the the current norm sort of thinking is not really thinking about. So so Jai, so we have to wrap up so we can get to questions. But Jai wants to see more B two B businesses. Maybe each of you can just say in, in quick 10, 15 seconds what are the kinds of businesses you would like to see more of coming out of Korea, really quickly. If if you can, I know it's a tough one. Yeah, well, I'm really excited about the whole IoT space, and I know that the next panel is going to address yep. that. So so I'd love to see. I mean, Korea has been great at at hardware so far. Now I would love to see the, the software on the same level as the hardware and both of them communicating and making sense uh, to the rest of the world. That's something that I'm really waiting for, and I think there's tremendous potential here for, for those type of companies. Uh, so that's what I'm waiting John? for. John? Um, so I'm still stuck back in age in mobile because I, st I still think there's massive opportunities. So mobile effectively equates to this is mine, so this is personal, and peer-to-peer and distribute systems, which is kind of touching on the Uberization of type stuff, which is how can you create uh, distributed, decentralized solutions which are not uh, managed or, uh, holistically in the center? And I'm mm -hmm. not quite sure what those look like, but I think there's a really interesting, right. there's a lot of opportunity which we haven't even got close to. David? So on the mobile side, I agree with that. I think in the old days when there was a closed uh, APIs and it was only the carriers making all of the apps. Uh, now it's open, but uh, they were innovating inside the company and a lot of interesting things that some of the carriers in the West were, were looking at and saying, "Hey, why don't we do that?" Um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are looking at it right now, but I think making things more mobile. If there's more devices people are using, that it's kind of you know it's on all devices. It's very ubiquitous. I think that's becoming much more interesting. Mm, yeah, and, and sorry, the, the, having thought about it for 10 seconds, it's actually the density of the phones and the strength and the, the density and critical mass of the phones which exist in Korea and, so, uh, and Seoul itself actually allow it to become really interesting as a test bed. Great. I, I personally like to see less language specific and culture specific products coming out of Korea because you guys have such a strong technology base and such a deep uh, uh, understanding of you know uh, hardware like you say um, that's a great platform play that I think you know South Korean entrepreneurs can really leverage if you don't from the beginning stop focusing on the Korean market specifically so that's that's my two cents um, we we'd like to open up for questions so right there oh well why, why don't you go you're straight up yeah. No, you. Yeah. yeah. Hi. I'd like to ask you a question about your expectation around exits. Okay. Or mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that uh, is exciting about Korea is that we're seeing a lot of incubators and startups brought up everywhere. There's a lot of early capital. However, it is really, really hard to get exits out of Korea. Yes. Right. Yes. Successful exits. That you all know that. So I would love to understand what your expectation around exits in Korea, what that means, and what can we do more in terms of trying to foster the exit dynamics out of Korea? Let me add to that, and, and, and I think that's a very important question because the exit uh, environment is pretty much the most critical to any startup ecosystem. And I agree we haven't seen enough of it here. It's where I think government can play a big role. But I'd uh, love to hear you guys' thoughts. Um, so Europe's better, but not as good as say, for example, the US. So what, what I see is you have to start with when you're investing is businesses that genuinely have global potential and you can sell outside of the shores of what you're doing. So you um, think the exits will still happen outside correct. of Korea? In the short term, uh, I think one has to still look to other third parties. Um, but the second part is, is that I think there's an increasing appetite around corporates um, whether they can do it or not is still unknown to actually do investments. And quite recently I read an article which was interesting that the corporates are now completely bypassing their investment banks for M&A activity, which is actually a really positive sign mm -hmm. because they're much more willing to move quickly, they're much more willing to, to look at businesses they wouldn't look at because they weren't big dollar amounts. They're much more willing to look at external organizations to, to try and innovate themselves. So. I think 
maybe the shortcut to your question is, um, in the short term, it's not going to happen. It has to happen externally, but I think it may grow internally from other corporate activity outside of the direct tech sector itself. Great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I would say, I, I, first of all, I agree with the global. I think definitely the companies need to have a global outlook from day one. Uh, there are some exceptions, but like I said, most of the access will probably come from overseas, and therefore they need to be able to address the, mobile, the global market from day one and to build a business that can scale internationally. And that demands, you know, puts a lot of demands on the team. It's easier to address the whole market first and then after look, look for the next one. However, well, there is like an example, one of our uh, uh, favorite uh, uh, first, I think, uh, first or second class accelerate companies, Mimi Box, started out in Korea uh, and then moved on to Japan and from there on to the US. Uh, and and uh, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful little example. Well, there's, we're not talking about an exit, but if you're talking about a com company that started out in Korea addressing the local market, then the next similar market to the local market was in Japan, and then from there and jumped all over the way to address the US immediately, is, I think it's an interesting model for, mm -hmm. that might work for, for several companies here. So unless there's another, uh, if, if there's an opposing view, I'd love to hear it, but otherwise we should move on to another question. So I want, I want to talk about risk. Mm -hmm. um, you could argue that with the explosion of capital that there's a lot more risk in investing, and I agree with what Bill Gurley wrote on the subject. Nevertheless, looking at angel investing, I see that angels are getting more sophisticated, they're doing more due diligence, uh, and I could argue, you know, in looking back, and a couple times in the last few years when I've been raising money for something that's truly novel, mm -hmm. I've actually found that Series A and Series B investors, in some senses, um, have been more, more risk averse to uh, those sorts of uh, opportunities. Right. So I was wondering if you can comment either on, on that, and if you have a specific so, example of taking a little more risk, backing something novel that worked out well, or if you can just comment in general. So let me reframe that a little bit to talk about the marriage between novelty and timing. How do you guys see something that's novel and interesting? How do you time it with the market when you think about it potentially being a business that's relevant? So you know, just, just, just with that element in mind, because that's the most important one in my opinion. I can sort of give one perspective. Um, so uh, our philosophy is I generally agree that seed in early stage, there is probably two to three bands of discomfort in terms of risk appetite right now um, at the early stage. And I think fundamentally, the, the philosophy that we take is we're actually okay, we're okay missing an opportunity. Um, because I think the thing that we really have to go back to is fundamental problems and opportunities that can be solved by the teams. And so when we sort of gauge what are the really the deal breakers, that's kind of the guiding strategy. And, and I think the one other point to sort of think about is that um, seed is to prove X, X number of milestones. And, and whenever we ask an entrepreneur, you know, what do you want to do with this capital? And fundamentally, if it's not driven by data and milestones with a credible plan, it just doesn't work at the end of the day. It, you know, it's nice to build a product, but that's not the milestone. The milestone is how do you really get product market fit in a matter of typically 12 to 24 months you know, on a practical basis? And so if you don't have that perspective in mind at the stage, it, it, it's... It's kind of a non-starter, I think. I guess from from our perspective. I think I think you know, just wrap. I think you can you can take on a lot more risk if you have a lot more capital to inject. You know, that's that's basically it. So if you have something that's interesting enough, you can find someone that's aligned with it enough to put a lot of capital in. They're willing to take more risk, yeah. and and the company can then take more risk. Yeah. Um, one more question. We had a few hands earlier. There you go. So I, I wonder if you have been in a situation that you invested in some specific company and the company failed and you said to, 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 your, to yourself, oh man, it, they failed because of me. So have you been in such situation and why Why you think they failed? Do you have not done something correctly or you should be more involved and so on? Have you guys fucked up? I, I, think that there, I think that there are many reasons for why something might fail. And as, as sometimes it's a combination of, of miscommunication between uh, maybe uh, the investor and, and the entrepreneur. And sometimes it's just par parameters that you're not in control. Things change, the market change, the team change. 
um, uh, there are so many reasons for why something might fail. And I think that everybody here, you know, in a way you blame yourself. Why didn't I, you know, why didn't I see this earlier? Or I had a feeling, but why didn't I react then when I had that feeling that we're not going in the right direction yeah. and we're more actively involved guiding them in, in what at least what we thought is the right path? Just remember, investors don't have the answer to the future. It's, it's like, it's, it's a... It's both the entrepreneurs and investors like dancing tango together and trying to figure out who's, you know, sometimes the other one is leading and the other one takes over. It, it, it's not just like the investor has the answer. You should have walked down that path and you walk down this path. It, it's, it, it's, it's a tango where I'll, people... I'll, I'll give an example specifically yeah. where, I, where I fucked up. Um, is, um, <laughs> it's a company that most people here would know and it, it hasn't actually failed yet. It's just not growing as quickly as I'd like it to grow. And, you know, my mistake was going into an investment and we talk about pattern recognition... Our job really is to convey all the information that we have based on all the experience that we've had. And so I saw something that wasn't right with the installed CEO. It wasn't a founder that was a CEO when we invested. And I knew that there was an issue going to happen. But I didn't act fast enough. We kept him in the role. He was in the role for an extra eight months, eight months more than he should have been, when you know a month in, we should have replaced him. Uh, and that basically cost the company not just the time, but a lot of resources because that CEO was an expansion phase, whereas the company was still in you know, utility phase. It was still trying to really define the product. So it was very, very expensive. It's not just about changing the leadership. It changes the entire course of the company because your capital runway starts to change dramatically. Um, the market environment changes dramatically. And, and that was my fault. And I think a lot of us here try to advise entrepreneurs based on experience we have. Um, we just need to have the conviction to do it early. Just to add a little piece on to what he said, um, as, a, as an investor, you have a huge responsibility, and that's why they have board seats that you can sit on. And uh, you know, it, it's if fiduciarily, financially, you have to, if you see something wrong, you have to perk up and say something. But at the same time, I mean, it's all, it's a numbers game. You can invest in 10 companies, probably eight will fail, and hopefully those two will make back the rest of the money, and that's why it's called venture. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, the one thing I'd probably yeah. say is the other side of the equation is how do your investors react when you do fail? I think that comes about with maturity of market. Mm -hmm. So I'm a great believer that the way an investor deals with a business that doesn't work defines them as a human being and how their portfolio and how people around them perceive them. In less mature markets, what happens is Basically, the investor completely flips out and, and basically says, that's terrible. How can I screw some dollars out, cents out of the dollar out of this investment? And all it does is screw up all of his relationships around him. And all of the smartest investors I know is actually how you treat the failures defines you much more than how you... When somebody makes you money, it's really easy to be nice to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. I think we're done. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, you guys had a good time? All right, thanks. Great. Thank you.